just your name will do. If you're a guest with us, we'd love at least an email address, some way of contacting you to say thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, there's some places on here you can update us on information. If you need to change a phone number or an email address or something, uh, if you want to ask some questions about the church as well, uh, you can mark that on there. We will definitely get in touch with you this week. On the other side of that are two sign-ups in addition to our Wednesday night supper menu. Uh, and that is the Prepare Him Room Women's Event on December 16th. This is going to be an evening, just a couple of hours. Uh, there will be some food in the atrium to enjoy and then a simulcast in here. And it's just a time of worship, a time of inspiration and study to help you prepare your heart to make room for Jesus in a new way this Christmas season. So if you want to attend that, please check that there. And I encourage you, invite some of your friends to come and family members to come with you uh, to this women's event. Then you'll see that on Wednesday night, this Wednesday night, we're having our Lottie Moon dessert auction. So after dinner, we're going to uh, have a missions program. We're going to do a dessert auction. Every dollar goes to Lottie Moon. And then we're going to get to see our tiny kids do their annual living nativity. And that is always a joy and a blessing. So if you want to bring a dessert for that auction, just put your name, check that right there, and we'll be getting in touch with you about that. When you're finished with this, you can fold it in half, put it in the offering box as you leave, or just leave it there in the pew. And if you look in your order of worship, a couple of things I want to point out. Tuesday night, our tiny kids and teen kids are going to be singing at the tree lighting up at the hospital. So that's going to be a, it's a great honor that we have an opportunity to do that, that they're going to, get to share the love of Jesus with our community that way. So if you can show up there at 7 o'clock, support them, see that, that would be great. Uh, and then also, uh, you'll notice that uh, drive through Nativity is coming up Sunday, a week from today. That's hard to believe, isn't it, Matt? Amy, Paige, it's a little, little nerve-wracking, isn't it? It's right around the corner. <laughs> so if you have not yet decided you want to be a part of that, it is not too late. You can contact me, Matt, Paige. Batwell, Amy Limley, let us know, hey, I want to do this, I want to bring this, I want to be a part of it. Uh, it really does take as many people as we can possibly get to pull this thing off. And be in prayer for good weather uh, for that week. So pray for good weather and that we'll have a great turnout of people. I um, also want to point out that the Advent booklets are ready for you. We're doing things a little differently this year. So we've, we've put this together, and it's got all the stuff you're used to. It's got all the family activities like the Christmas light scavenger hunt, and it's got all the information about what's coming up each week and worship each week. Uh, it's got a letter at the beginning that I wrote, um, but the devotionals are provided by Dr. John Piper. Um, and so we had the uh, permission to use his devotionals for this, and we are going to... Take sort of a year off of having everybody write those devotionals, and next year when we do Christmas in July for our shoeboxes, in July we're going to get people to write their Advent devotionals for us. And so that will just be a, a, a lot uh, easier and less stressful on everyone. You're not trying to, you know, churn out an Advent devotional the week before Thanksgiving, which is usually what ends up happening. So we're going to do that next year, but these are fantastic devotionals. They're deep. They'll really make you think uh, as you prepare your heart uh, for Christmas this year. So there's one per family. Please pick this up. And again, there's great activities in here as well for families to use. Um, also, down here on the front pew, there are um, budget booklets and a little handout about the cooperative program. If you weren't there last Sunday night, you'd like to pick these up. They will be there for you to pick up at the end of the service. And at the end of the service today, we'll be having our vote um, on the proposed budget for 2024. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father, we are so thankful for this time of year, and it's a time of, of thanksgiving and gratitude. It's a time of celebration, of worship and praise and, and festivities, God. We're so thankful for that, a time to be with friends and family. And God, it gives us such a unique opportunity to focus our hearts on Jesus, on Emmanuel, God with us. It gives us such a unique opportunity to share the story of your grace, of our need for a Savior and your provision of that through Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, you would help us to really be intentional as we approach this Christmas year, Lord. We pray that you would help us to worship you, to grow in our faith, and to share the good news of Jesus with our friends, our family, and our community. May our worship today be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And the season of Advent starts next Sunday, but we're going to sneak in a little bit of Christmas music today. But really, we're going to focus on our thanksgiving to God and his goodness to us. Friends, let's stand together and let's open our hearts in praise for our Lord. Testament reading is Malachi 3, 6 through 12. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have, ne have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Our new 
New Testament reading is Matthew 16. I mean, well, our New Testament reading is Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Amen. And you guys can have a seat as we think about this for a little bit. God is the one who is good, and so he is the one that we should grow and work for. Let's sing these songs together of God's goodness and our love for him.
Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for the goodness you show me, Lord, that you bestow upon me and my family. Lord, without you, without your mercies and your grace and the salvation you sent to us through your Son, we would be nothing. But because of your love, Lord, you have graced us so much. Lord, I just ask you to be with this service the rest of the way, Lord, that it may be your service to your glory for your worship, Lord. But touch our hearts that we may go forth and present your goodness to this lost and dying world, Lord. Show them our testimony of what you've done for us. Lord, be with our pastors. Be with the congregation here, Lord, that we may be salt and light, a city upon the hill here, Lord, presenting you to this world. And all these things I ask in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's name, amen.
boys and girls, if you'll come on down. I have a message for you all. All right. Everybody doing good? Everybody have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah. 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 Did y'all eat lots of food? Yeah. They ate lots of food? Did anybody eat turkey? All right. Anybody eat? Anybody eat ham? Yeah. Does anybody eat some? Does anybody eat some pie or dessert? Oh yeah. Uh, oh, I like. Does anybody have sweet potato casserole? Anybody have any of that? No. Not everybody a fan of that. Okay. All right. I like that. Any dressing or stuffing? I, dressing. Okay. Dress. Yeah. All right. I like food. All right. So I like Thanksgiving. And it looks like some of you all do, too. All right. Today, we are talking about giving and giving our gifts uh, to God. And I wanted to read a short passage in the Bible, a short story. And I want you to listen to this. This is uh, Jesus with his disciples. This is what he saw, and then we're going to talk about it, okay? It says, Sitting across from the temple treasury... Jesus watched how the crowd dropped money into the treasury. So they were dropping this money uh, into collection boxes, kind of like our collection boxes that we have. Then uh, uh, it says many rich people were putting in large sums of money. So they were putting in a lot of money, like coins, real heavy coins. And when you put in real heavy coins, do you think it makes a lot of noise? Yeah. So some people were putting in a lot of money for other people to hear how much they were putting in. Putting in. But listen to this. Then a poor widow lady, so her husband had died, she came and dropped in two tiny coins worth very little. And then uh, Jesus called over his disciples and he said to them, I, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more into the treasury than all the others. For they all gave out of their surplus. So they all had lots of money to give. And they just gave some of what they had. But she, out of her poverty, she was poor, she put in everything she had, all she had to live on. So the coin that she put in, uh, today we call it a widow's mite, and I wanted to show that picture up there. That's kind of a, it's kind of a grainy picture, but uh, th what it is, is the, it's the smallest coin that was used during the time of Jesus, so kind of like our penny. Uh, it wasn't worth very much, um, and uh, and I'm going to have Maylee handing these out, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, but I'm going to give you one. This one is a replica, so it's, uh, uh, it looks like what they would have looked like, and it, it feels real, uh, but hold on to it. So don't put it in your, uh, your, your offering boxes or anything like that, because it won't be worth anything. But I'm going give, to give these to you and talk about them. Let's leave them in the bags, too, right now, okay? But... Maylee is going to hand those out. And why she hands those out, so parents, uh, so you can answer these questions when they ask uh, what's on there. Uh, it was a simple made coin. And this coin was made about 100 B.C. Uh, when the Greeks were, were in the land of Israel. And so the first one on the left side right there, up on the screen, uh, that's an anchor that's written there. And on their coins, you'll actually see some writing, and that's actually the Greek name of the king at that time. Alexander. It says King Alexander, but it's written in Greek. Uh, he was not a very nice king, and he said he was also the high priest, so the Jews didn't really like that. Um, on the other side, and you can kind of see that star and the lines going off of that, that's an old symbol that goes all the way to King David uh, that the Jews used. So it kind of, this coin kind of shows the time that it was made, but it was still used uh, when Jesus was there. So what I want us to do, I think this is a good connection. Also, uh, Next week, when we have the hanging of the green and Advent, both those symbols, the anchor and the star, is also used that we can remember about Jesus. So the anchor doesn't represent some king, Greek king. It reminds us, should remind us, of the king of kings, of Jesus, that we want to give our best gifts to him. And, of course, the star on the other side uh, can remind us during this time of the star uh, that was over Bethlehem that, that reminded us of the king of kings. So it reminds us that, that Jesus is the King of Kings. Uh, he is worth, worth it all. And just like this uh, widow lady, she gave all that she had. And Jesus recognized that, that even though those coins that she put in, they weren't worth a lot, in his eyes it was worth everything because that was all she had to live on. I think, I think she was blessed from that. Uh, God took notice of that. 
And, and that's what God wants us to do, is to give our best gifts to Him. It might not be money, it might be our, our time, it might be some other types of ways that we can help others or, or help sing. Sometimes y'all are up here singing, you're giving your gifts to God when we do that. And we want to give our very best. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for who you are. And as we uh, had Thanksgiving, we we're so thankful for your son and for what he's done for us, that he is the king of kings, Lord. He is the light into the world. And God, so maybe this, uh, this coin can just be a small reminder of that, that we want to give our best gifts to you always. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, children two and th uh, three-year-olds, you are invited to children's church. Yeah, you can hold on to those. Those are yours to keep. Yep. And there are a few extra. So if there's some kids missing, we have a few extra. And if you would like one, adults, make sure the kids get them after the service. But I have a few extra if, if uh, you'd like to pick one up. And, uh -huh. Now, you probably noticed some of the Christmas decorations up. And it's like, you know, golly, David, the turkey's not even gone cold yet. We're not even tired of the leftovers yet. We already got Christmas decorations up. Well, last night we had a wonderful concert of the Mark Trammell Quartet and the Wisnets were here. Tonight we're going to have a community choral concert, uh, so I hope you'll come back tonight at 5 o'clock for that concert as well. There'll be an uh, a orchestra up here and the choir's going to sing some just beautiful uh, classical music and some, and some newer songs as well. It's going to be a wonderful time. So we do have some Christmas decorations up for that, but next Sunday morning is the first Sunday of Advent, and it's the beginning of our Advent and Christmas season, and we're going to do the Hanging of the Green service. So I hope that you'll come back next week. Parents, it's a great service to have your children here. They'll learn all about the meaning behind all the different symbols that we use at Christmas. Uh, they'll get to help participate in the service as well. So it's going to be a wonderful, fun time next Sunday. So make sure you pick up an Advent book today so you can have it ready to go. And it will start on the 1st of December, which is a little different for us. We usually start just on that first Sunday of Advent. But this was a, a 25 days uh, uh, Advent devotional. So it will begin on Friday. Okay, So make sure you pick this up before you go. And I hope that you'll come tonight to that concert and come back next Sunday morning for our Hanging of the Green service. This past month, we've been focusing on grace and how God gives us grace enough Grace enough for eternal life, grace enough for abundant life today, that God's grace is enough for the forgiveness of our sins, for the saving of our souls, but it's also enough grace for living our lives day after day. And we've specifically talked about how God gives us grace enough to grieve. He gives us grace enough to be grateful. He gives us grace enough to serve. And finally this morning, He gives us grace enough to give. I want to invite you to turn with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And as you do that, I'm going to have a word of prayer for us. Father, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful, Lord, for the journey you've led us on this past month as we have explored about your grace that surpasses our understanding, your grace that, that more than supplies our needs. You, you give us an abundance of that grace so that it can overflow from our lives and bless the lives of others. And we pray now, Lord, as we conclude this series of messages, that you will continue to speak to us from your word and convict us where we need to be convicted, challenge us where we need to be challenged, encourage and equip us where we need to be motivated and given what we need to be obedient to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to be going back and forth between 8 and 9, so kind of keep... Keep your fingers on that, and we're going to be going back and forth here. Let's look at chapter 8, verse 7. Paul says, Now as you excel in everything, in faith, speech, knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love for us, excel also in this act of grace. Now turn over to chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. And then look at verses 14 and 15. And as they pray on your behalf, they will have deep affection for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Now the context for this entire letter, but especially these two chapters, is Paul's third missionary journey. 
and, and part of the impetus to that third journey that Paul took was to go back to all of these churches that he had planted in Asia Minor and in Greece. He had, he had gone through uh, all these Gentile churches mainly. He's going back through them to collect an offering, an offering to send back to Jerusalem to the believers there because they are suffering extreme poverty, they're, they're suffering persecution. There's a famine in the land. There's a great need for the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And so he's going to all these churches, collecting this offering to take back for them. And in these two chapters in particular, he's talking about this offering and he's encouraging the Corinthian Christians to quit dragging their feet and fulfill the promise they've made. They've already agreed to give to this offering, but they've been slow to follow through on their commitment. And why is that? Well, the Corinthian church, if you know anything about First and Second Corinthians, was not a healthy church. They were an inwardly focused church filled with inwardly focused Christians. They were divided, they lacked unity, and they didn't have really any deep appreciation of God's grace. You know, when we as Christians truly believe that it is more blessed to give than to receive, we can experience the grace of giving. And that's what the Corinthian Christians had lost sight of. They, they had become so focused on themselves, they forgot that God blessed them so they could in turn bless others. So in these two chapters, Paul gives us three examples for us to look at. The Macedonian Christians, which he'll mention, the Corinthian Christians and Jesus Himself. And by looking at these three, we're going to learn that there is grace enough to give. First of all, there's grace enough to give no matter the circumstances. No matter the circumstances, no matter what's going on in our lives, there's grace enough to give. Look at chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. During a severe trial brought about by affliction, their abundant joy... And their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. So these Macedonian Christians, they themselves were experiencing some times of extreme hardship. Yet they were still generous in their gifts to the Jerusalem believers. They were going above and beyond even Paul's expectations for them. They themselves were in deep poverty, likely because of persecution. How easy would it have been for them to say to Paul, Paul, listen, we would love to give. Oh, our hearts go out to our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, but we got our own problems. We're struggling. We got to make our own ends meet before we can help someone else out. They could have easily, and in and, and, and many people's eyes, justifiably be able to say that. But they instead gave joyfully, and freely. And Paul almost gives us a formula there in verse 2. Look what he says. He basically says that when we have severe trials and extreme poverty, if we add to those things God's grace, it will result in overflowing joy and rich generosity. That's almost counterintuitive. That from our lack, from our suffering, from our own trials and poverty, if you just add God's grace to it, it will overflow with joy and with generosity. They refused to use their difficult circumstances as an excuse. Instead, they gave generously and joyfully out of God's grace to them. Now, I get it. I understand. Economic circumstances, financial difficulties, that's a real thing. And it's a reality that we can't afford to ignore. But I've also learned that whether it's a season of want or a season of abundance, whether you've got a lot or you don't have much... We can always find an excuse, a reason not to give, can't we? We always have this temptation to be tight-fisted with our hard-earned dollars. So how can we be less like the Corinthians here and more like the Macedonians? Well, if you believe that by the grace of God you have access to eternal riches in Christ Jesus, then you should also believe what Jesus says in Matthew 6. When he says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear, your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Amen. We need to learn from these struggling first century believers that no matter our circumstances, there is grace enough 
for us to give. Just like the widow. Even if it's just two mites. Even if it's just the last two pennies you have to rub together. God says that if you will give, He will bless. He will see that. He will acknowledge that. He will supply our needs when we trust in Him. There's grace enough to give no matter the circumstances. And secondly, there's grace enough to give enthusiastically. Look back at verses 3 and 4, chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Paul goes on to say, I can testify that according to their abilities, talking again about the Macedonians, according to their ability and even beyond their ability of their own accord, they begged us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in the ministry of to the saints. And then on in that first part of verse 5, he says, and not just as we had hoped. So in other words, they went beyond Paul's expectations. Now look over at chapter 9, verse 7. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. So the Macedonian Christians didn't need their arms twisted. Paul didn't have to put any undue pressure on them. They were more than willing to give their share of this offering. In fact, they begged for the privilege to be a part of this effort. How often have you begged God for Him to let you give? Have you begged God, God, just let me give more. God, just let me do more for you. These Christians gave voluntarily. They gave eagerly. Because they had experienced God's grace so richly. See, grace not only frees us from our sin, it frees us from ourselves. You know, last week we talked about how serving not only comes out of the freedom we have in Christ, but serving sets us free. It sets us free from guilt. We can serve in love. It sets us free from this desire to be rewarded. Instead, we serve out of relationship. Listen, giving is not that different than serving. In fact, giving is just a different form of serving. Service is a stewardship of our time and our talents. Giving is a stewardship of the tithe and our treasures. They're two sides of the same coin. And God's grace is the only explanation for the eagerness and generosity of these Macedonian believers. And guess what? That same grace is given to us. We are recipients of the same grace they received. Are we eager to give to the Lord? Are we begging God to let us be more a part of what He's doing in the world? How generous are we being with the resources that God has entrusted to us. There's grace enough to give no matter your circumstances in life. There's grace enough to give enthusiastically. And third, there's grace enough to give ourselves. Look at verse 5 through 7 in chapter 8. Paul goes on to say that they gave not just as we had hoped, instead they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us by God's will. So he urged Titus that just as he had begun, he should also complete among you this act of grace. So Paul has sent Titus ahead to be at work in the Corinthian church to collect this offering. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, speech, knowledge, and all diligence, and in your love for us, excel also in this act of grace. Listen, if we give ourselves to God, we're going to have little trouble giving Him our time, our energy, and our resources. If you've already given yourselves to God, it's then only natural that you're going to want to give yourselves to His bride, the church. You're going to want to give yourselves to His mission to make disciples of Jesus from all generations among our neighbors and the nations. The Bible teaches us that it's impossible to love God and ignore the needs of the people around us. How can we say that we love God if we don't care about the very people made in His image for whom Jesus died? If our heart doesn't break for those who are lost and dying in their sins, how can we say that we're passionately in love with Jesus who gave His life for them? When we bring to God His tithe, when we give our offerings and time and talents, this is a spiritual matter because we are reflecting the image in which we were made. We are created in God's image to be givers because guess what? God is a giver. For God so loved the world, He gave. 
His one and only Son. And we should be willing to give ourselves to Him, to His church, and to a world lost and dying in its sin. Paul says in Acts 20, 24, he says, I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose, this is the reason he lives, is to finish my course and the ministry I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Boy, that should be the prayer of each of us. Lord, my life is of no value to me except for this, that I finish the work that you've given me. And that is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus in word and in deed, to make disciples of all nations, to fulfill the Great Commission. And guess what? That's not just something he gave to preachers. That's something he gave to every believer in Jesus Christ. We all have this ministry to complete. Paul says that these Corinthian Christians were excelling in many things. He doesn't often say good things about the Corinthians. So, so this is profound. He says that they're excelling in faith. They've got gifted teachers. They have knowledge of God's Word. They're enthusiastic. They have love for Paul and for his team. They were excelling at many things. Well, guess what? First Baptist Thompson is also excelling at many things. We have been blessed beyond measure, and I honestly believe our church does a great job of taking that blessing of God and using it to pass on and bless others. I want to share with us just a few examples of how our church has been excelling in the grace of giving. This past year, through our monthly ministry collection in the atrium, that's the blue box in the atrium by the elevator, and through other donations that people have made, along with a little assistance from the Go and Tell Fund, we have done some amazing things this year. This is just a sampling. We provided a hundred welcome baskets to women escaping abusive situations as they go to safe homes in Augusta. Women who are, who are fleeing oftentimes for their safety and lives or that of their children, and they get a basket from our church the minute they walk in the door at Safe Homes Augusta. We gave, exceeding our goal, we gave 329 shoeboxes to Operation Christmas Child. I'm so excited about that. We exceeded our goal this year. Uh, we've not often done that in years past, so I'm thankful for that. And then we processed another 1,500 shoeboxes from churches in our area, and I am grateful for our team who worked so hard the past week and a half or so to do that. Let's give them a hand, by the way, just to thank them for that. We have 75 wheelchair ramps that are out being used right now in our surrounding area. We gave 95 new teacher bags to McDuffie County teachers. We, uh, one of our Sunday school classes has provided 50 bags for swing bed patients up at Piedmont McDuffie. So when those patients are coming there, they're there for rehab, they're transitioning, uh, hopefully they get to go home soon, they've got a bag of some stuff that can keep them occupied, and they've got resources to do even more when those run out. We have bags of hygiene items and gift cards that we give to homeless or transient people coming to our church for help, and I can't even begin to count the hundreds and hundreds of pounds of food items we've donated to manna. That's just a sample of some of the ways this church's generosity is touching lives in McDuffie County and in, in the CSRA. Through last Sunday, we have given $43,226 to our Go and Tell Mission Fund, which if we keep up this pace, this next month will mean that that's the most money we've ever given to this fund. It breaks our previous record. Amen to that. And when you combine this with the money we have in the budget through your undesignated tithes, we are giving $10,687 to the Kilpatrick Baptist Association, $9,312 to Manna, our local food pantry, and $9,312 to Smoky Mountain Resort Ministries as they minister to people who live, play, and work in the Great Smoky Mountains and in Sevier County. From our Go and Tell Fund alone through the end of October, we've also given $3,847 to the Georgia Baptist Children's Home, $6,700 to Global Hunger Relief, $2,500 to Georgia Baptist Disaster Relief, uh, almost $1,700 going towards supplies for our Honduras mission team to take down and to bless the people there in Honduras. 
and then we've got a fund for our own church's local mission projects like that Sunday school class I mentioned, the wheelchair ramps, the new teacher bags, things that we do locally here, we've got almost $14,000 in that fund. Praise God for the generosity of His people here at First Baptist Thompson. And I'm also proud to say that this year we have exceeded all of our special mission offering goals, which means that in next year's budget we're raising those goals. We have given $5,126 to Mission Georgia. That's $1,500 over our goal. That's going to help our state convention uh, tackle five ministry areas, human trafficking in Georgia, childhood literacy in Georgia, maternity care, foster care and adoption, and reaching the refugees and international people here in Georgia. God is bringing the nations to us, and we can reach them right here in our state. Praise God. In our 2022, because this we're coming up on 2023, in our 2022 Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions, we exceeded our goal over $4,000. We gave $17,303 to international missions. Every penny of that goes on the mission field overseas to reach the nations. And we are reaching our neighbors through the North American Mission Board as we gave over $1,500 over our goal, 11456 through the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Again, let's give God praise for this. Amen? I'm so proud. I'm so excited of what God is doing through our church family. But what about you and your family? What about me and my family? Have we considered how we can excel more and more in this grace of giving as we give our time and our talents? as we share our life experiences and wisdom with others, as we comfort those who are suffering through or struggling through things we have suffered and struggled through? What about all the ways that God has blessed us materially? How can you excel in hospitality and opening up your home or your, or your dining room table to a neighbor that's maybe in need or lonely or, or to invite a new family at our church over for dinner after church one Sunday? or to have your Sunday school class over, or to invite that friend or coworker for dinner that you're trying to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ? How can you loan to others the things that God has blessed you with? Maybe you've got a, a vacation home, or a rarely used extra car, or a lawnmower. Imagine if our church, with all the resources we have, if we were sharing that with each other and with people in need, imagine the impact that God could, could work through us in our community. And, and as I've mentioned before, the church office would love to maintain a list of some of those special items that you may have that you could say, listen, if somebody's really in need, I've got this, I've got that, I can help in this way. And we'd love to be able to take that need and meet it up with that resource that God has blessed our church with. Can you imagine someone saying, I think I know everything I could ever know about the Bible. I, I, I've got it. I don't need to study it anymore. I don't need to read it anymore. I've got it. Or imagine someone saying, you know, I don't need to grow in my faith anymore. I now have perfect faith. How ridiculous would that be, Right? But what about our need to grow and excel more in our capacity to serve and give and share? Are you content with your level of serving? With your level of giving? Like the Corinthian Christians, we need to examine how well we are excelling in this gracious act of giving. But we can't excel in giving if we're withholding ourselves from God's rule and reign in our hearts. We need to surrender ourselves first to God, and then we'll find that giving and serving flows more freely and joyfully and generously from our hearts. He wants us to give ourselves to Him first. There's grace enough for that. And there's grace enough for us to give like Jesus. Look at chapter 8, verse 8. Paul says, I'm not saying this is a command. Rather, by means of the diligence of others, I am testing the genuineness of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Though He was rich, for your sake He became poor, so that by His poverty you might become rich. And then look at chapter 9, verses 12 through 15. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints 
but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. We looked at these verses a few weeks ago as we talked about grace enough for gratitude. He says, Because of the proof provided by this ministry, they will glorify God, meaning the, the believers in Jerusalem, for your obedient confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. And as they pray on your behalf, they will have deep affection for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Our motivation for giving, Paul says, should be the same as that is for Jesus. Love. Love is the reason that we give. Notice Paul says, I'm not ordering you to give, but I'm encouraging you to give. And he encourages them to give by lifting up the example and the attitude of the Macedonian Christians and of Jesus himself. Like Jesus, the Macedonians were poor, yet they gave sacrificially, exceeding all expectations. Now the Corinthians, they said that they loved Paul. They said they loved the other believers. But Paul challenges them to put their money where their mouth is and prove their love by their actions. Grace giving is evidence of our love for Christ, our love for His bride, the church, and our love for a world that's lost and dying. Jesus, being in very nature God, did not hold on to His divine privilege with a tight fist. He left His kingly throne to become a servant. And He took upon Himself your sin and my sin. In His human body, He bore in His flesh our guilt and our shame. He left the glory of heaven to come to a world where He wouldn't even have a place to lay His head. And in that ultimate act of sacrificial giving, He took upon Himself the ultimate poverty. He took your poverty and my poverty upon Himself so He could give us the riches of His grace. He took your sin and my sin upon Himself, becoming sin Himself, that we might be the righteous of God. We who are spiritually bankrupt can now share in Christ's eternal riches. As Paul says in Romans 8, 17, we are now heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Amen. So having experienced this grace, how can we refuse to give to others in His name? God proved His love to us by giving us His best. He gave Jesus truly an indescribable gift. And guess what? We can also express the genuineness of our love for God and for others as we give, as we serve. Because there is also grace enough to give willingly. To give willingly. Look back at chapter 8, verses 10 through 12. And in this matter, I am giving advice because it is profitable for you who began last year not only to do something, but also to want to do it. Now also finish the task, so that just as there was, a, there was an eager desire, there may also be a completion according to what you have. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. And then look over at chapter 9, verse 5. Therefore, I consider it necessary to urge you, brothers, to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance the generous gift you promised so that it will be ready as a gift and not as an extortion. So the Corinthian Christians initially were eager to be a part of this offering. They wanted to participate, but they weren't following through on their commitment. There's a difference between having a willingness to do something and actually following through and doing it, isn't there? Parents, right? If your kids are willing to obey, but they don't obey, have they obeyed? No. That's disobedience. If you've got employees, if they're willing to do their job, but they don't do their job, did they do their job? No. Students, if you're willing to do your homework and you're excited about that assignment, did that ever happen? But you don't turn it in, what do you get? A zero. You don't get an E for effort. You get an F for failure, right? That's, that's what's happening here. Willingness is not a substitute for doing, for giving, for serving. But if our giving is motivated by grace, we will give willingly. Not because we're forced to, not because we've been made guilty to do it. We're going to do it enthusiastically and cheerfully. 
in our Old Testament reading in Malachi 3, it talks about bringing the whole tithe into God's storehouse. Tithe literally means a tenth. Let's look back at verses 8 through 10 of this. God asks, he says, Will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? How do we rob you, you ask? By not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions. You are suffering under a curse, yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Bring the full tithe, the full tenth, into the storehouse so there may be food in my house. Test me in this way. It's the only time in the Bible that we're commanded to test God. Test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. In the Old Testament, God commanded His people to return 10% of their increase to the temple storehouse. And this was used to care for the, the orphan, the widow, the poor. It was used to support the priests and just to support the general ministry and work of the temple. God was very serious about His people, Israel, tithing. It was a recognition that everything belonged to God. It reminded them that everything was a gift of God's grace, even the land that they were living on, the land they were working, when they raised this produce, that it was a gift of God to them. They were only managing God's assets. It belonged to Him. It didn't belong to them. Bringing God His tithe was a debt they owed, and if you didn't pay your debt, you were robbing God. That's why Malachi says to bring the tithe into the storehouse, not give the tithe. We do not give God our tithe because it's already His. The tithe already belongs to Him. We owe it to Him. We're to bring it to Him to His storehouse, which today is the local church, not the temple. This is where worship and ministry and service and meeting people's needs is done through in God's kingdom. But guess what? In the New Testament, that's the Old Testament. In the New Testament... The tithe is no longer the standard. Jesus is the standard. Jesus is the standard. And Jesus gave His all to pay our all, and so all to Him I owe. Everything. We are still only stewards, managers, wisely handling all that God has gifted us. The tithe is the bare minimum that we're expected to bring to God. He still expects us to take that other 90% and use it wisely for His glory and to use it generously to help others and to use it sacrificially to extend His kingdom through the spread of the gospel around the world. Notice in this text, God doesn't expect us to give beyond what He has already given us. Paul says that. Whether we're talking about tithing or going over and beyond, we give in proportion to what God entrusts to us. That's what Paul says. We can think of tithing as training wheels on a bicycle. Okay, you, ever, you learned to ride a bicycle, maybe you had training wheels like I did. I finally got them off about three years ago. It was great. <laughs> Just kidding. You know, when you first are riding that bicycle, you got those training wheels on, they're kind of restricting, right? You can't really do some of the stuff you would be able to do without them. But they're necessary at first. The tithe is like those training wheels. But the more we ride that bike of giving and generosity, by God's grace, those training wheels can come off and we experience a freedom and a joy to give as God provides for us and leads us to give. Grace giving isn't limited to the tithe. It isn't interested in trying to get by with just the bare minimum requirement. Grace giving is always trying to figure out how it can give more than it knows it can give. It's a lifestyle of giving by faith, which once again Jesus Christ gives us by His grace. So finally we see there is grace enough to give by faith. Look at verses 13 through 15 of chapter 8. He says, It is not that there should be relief for others and hardship for you, but it is a question of quality. At the present time, your surplus is available for their need, so that their abundance may in turn meet your need, in order that there may be equality. As it is written, The person who had much did not have too much, and the person who had little did not have too little. And then look at chapter 9, verses 8 through 11. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, 
you may excel in every good work. As it is written, He distributed freely. He gave to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now the one, meaning God, who provides seed for the sower and bread for food, will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. Paul here in chapter 8 uses the example of the manna in the wilderness. And it's a great example of living and giving by faith because no matter how much manna the Jews gathered each day, they always had just enough for that day. No more, no less. And in fact, if they tried to hoard the manna overnight, what happened to it? It rotted and it stunk. The lesson is simple. Gather what you need, share what you can, and don't try to hoard God's blessings. Gather what you need, share what you can, and don't try to hoard God's blessings. Trust that God will give you each day your daily bread. Grace giving is a matter of faith. It's a matter of trusting God's goodness and provision that your good shepherd will supply all your needs. You know, just, just as we are saved by grace through faith, we have to give by grace through faith. And when we do, we will experience an amazing freedom from consumerism and materialism and worry, that need to keep up with the Joneses. We're set free from that. And we begin to develop new values, new priorities. Grace giving blesses you as you bless others. It transforms you more and more into the image of Christ. It allows you to be an active part of God's redemptive work in the world. And that begins in your own heart and with your own family. And it extends to your church and to your school and to your workplace and to your neighborhood and to your community and to the ends of the earth. Are you excelling in the grace of giving? Are you willing to work at excelling more in the grace of giving? Now, last week I challenged us to work on getting to a place where we're serving the Lord at least two hours every week. It's not much, two hours every week. You spend more time than that on your smartphone probably in a day. Two hours a week serving God, whether that's through the church or in your schools or your, your community, in some way serve the Lord. Well, I want to challenge us this week to also work on excelling in the grace of giving. I've already mentioned the many ways I think we as a church are doing that. We're excelling. There's always room to improve. There's always room to do more. Are you giving to the Go and Tell Fund regularly? You know, the more that comes into that fund, because it's all based on percentages, the more that comes into that fund, the more we get to disperse. The more needs we get to meet and disciples we get to make as we give to that. Or maybe the question for you is, how would God have you give this year to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering? I believe that we will exceed this year's goal just as we did last year, just as we've done all of our special offerings this year. How will God have you participate in that act of grace? Are you bringing all of God's tithe into His storehouse? And listen, I want to encourage you. Remember, this isn't about guilt. It's all about grace. Grace is the word here. This is not about guilt. It's about grace. You may say, well, David, I just don't think I can give 10%. I, I, I just don't think I, I, I just can't do that. Listen, baby steps in obedience is better than disobedience. Maybe God next year will have you increase your giving 0.25%, 0.5%, 1%, whatever it is. I pray that God will give you the faith to trust Him and you give as God leads you. You give as God provides for you. That's where faith comes in. When we trust that God will enable us by His grace to give what He's calling us to give. And as I said earlier, the tithe is the low bar for the Christian. The important thing is that you're prayerfully seeking to give God what He's leading you to give, and you do it cheerfully, you do it willingly, you do it enthusiastically, you do it from a heart of gratitude and love for God, for people, and for the Great Commission. Is that where you are in the grace of giving? We're proposing a $32,000 increase in next year's budget much of that going towards meeting the increasing needs we have in our next generation ministries. 
from, from preschool, from the nursery, preschool, children, youth, and college students, God is blessing our church, and we are growing. And so we're including funds in next year's budget for a part-time children's ministry coordinator. We want, from, from cradle to college, we want to be a part of what God is doing in our church right now for the next generation. It's like we talked about when I preached on Jesus is the vine, where you see a branch being fruitful, you want to prune it, you want to tend it, so it'll be more fruitful. And that's what we want to see as we reach families and children in our community. And given what we see in the news every day, I think you'll agree with me that now is not the time for Christians or churches to pull back or retreat from the encroaching darkness of the world. Amen? Amen. The world needs more of God's people going out as light into the darkness and being salt in the earth. The generations to come need Jesus. And they need His church to invest in them and to equip and encourage their parents and to strengthen their marriages. And that's what we as a church want to do, particularly going in to 2024. The need is great. The time is urgent. But guess what? Here's the good news. Our supplies are limitless. The on a thousand hills. He wants for nothing. The question is, will we give in faith? Will we release those resources He has given us with eagerness so the hungry can be fed, the sick can be tended, and the lost can be saved. Will we? But you know what? You can't excel in the grace of giving if you yourself have not received God's grace given to you. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Jesus died upon that cross. He gave His all for you. He became sin that you might become the righteousness of God. If you've never received that free gift of God's Grace, that indescribable gift Paul calls, I invite you this morning, right now, to come and to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. As a Christian, maybe you've been worshiping with us, serving with us, and you know this is the church family that God would have you to excel in service and in giving. You want to come and experience here and share here more of God's grace. We invite you to come. Maybe this morning God is calling someone in this room or watching online or listening at home on the radio, maybe God is calling you into ministry. Whether that's a, a volunteer ministry through the church or if God's calling you to full-time Christian vocational service, will you obey what the Spirit of God is saying to you? And for every one of us, let's examine ourselves. Are we excelling in the grace of giving? Are we giving by faith, willingly, enthusiastically, out of love for God, for His church, and for this world. Would you stand with me and pray? Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the challenge that it gives to us. We thank You, Lord, for the, the instruction it gives to us. And sometimes these things are hard for us to, to really absorb and to take in. And, and our world's priorities are very different than the kingdom of God. It can be hard for us sometimes, Lord, to see that. But I pray your Spirit would work in our hearts, work in our minds, that we would want to give and serve and go and tell, not out of guilt, but out of grace, not under compulsion, but cheerfully. Father, may we as a church, may we as individuals, may I and my family, Lord, may we excel in this grace of giving, that all gratitude and praise will be given to Jesus. It's in His name we pray.
It's been said, I think it was Dwight Moody that said this, that the world has never seen what God can do with the people wholly surrendered to Him. If we truly meant what we just sang, imagine what God could do through this church in little old Thompson, Georgia, to impact the world. I'm excited about the future of our church. I'm excited about the vision that's represented in this booklet right here, this budget that we're about to vote on that we discussed last Sunday night. I'm excited about some other things that are going to be coming next year to you as a church. God is at work. He is on the move. Amen? Amen. I can feel it. I can see it. And I hope that you will join me in praying every day for this church. Pray every day for the mission and ministry of this church. That we truly will love God, love people, and make disciples of Jesus from all generations. There are people out there that need the grace of God. They need to hear this good news. Will we take it to them? John Osborne is going to come now. He is our church treasurer and I'm going to call us to a very brief uh, church conference as we will vote on the 2024 budget. Last Sunday evening, 